We can make this actually pretty short tonight, right? So uh, all you folks complaining about Android build speed, w w what you're not getting is the following. <laughs> Are we in Sweden or what? So uh, I had to laugh when I saw the following tweet about this meetup. Uh, <laughs> it actually doesn't take any bravery. Uh, so excellent work has been done by the Google Android team and by the Gradle engineering team. And uh, I could be more excited to talk about this topic. Uh, it's actually, it's a pri privilege to represent that work. And uh, so I will give an overview, explain some concepts, uh, show some performance numbers, and to talk about some of the latest Gradle performance features. And then Zev will deep dive into all the areas uh, uh, of the Android plugin, right, that have been improved and, and what is on the roadmap. Uh, OK. so. Um, there has been great progress. Uh, some of it is already GA as part of the uh, uh, Android plugin 2.3 and Gradle 3.4. Other improvements are still in alpha. It's all publicly accessible. And uh, the scenarios we will look at uh, in more detail uh, when, it, when we show the performance numbers are the three following scenarios uh, uh, that arguably reflect the most common build scenarios for developers. Right, so it's a, a full rebuild of a single variant. It's an ABI change. ABI change means like changing the signature of a public method, and it's a non-ABI change, for example, changing the implementation of a method. Um, and the reason why we distinguish between an ABI change and a non-ABI change is uh, that they allow for different optimizations. So before you, before we show you the numbers, let's talk about those optimizations in more detail, because I think there is some confusion around cer certain terms and. It will make it easier to reason about the numbers later. OK, so the first optimization I want to talk about is called compile avoidance. Uh, so let's assume we have two modules, where module 2 depends on module 1. And for a build system to provide compile avoidance, it does not need to understand anything about the relationships between the individual classes. Right? So the way it works, when anything changes in module 1, not anything, a non-ABI change, Right? Uh, what happens is that module 1 still gets fully recompiled. Right? Uh, but uh, what is relatively simple to do is to analyze whether the change in module 1 has changed the ABI of module 1. And if not, we don't need to recompile any dependent modules. Right? So we don't need to understand anything about module 2 to make that call. And probably many changes fall into, a category, into that category. So uh, the other nice thing with compile avoidance, it also improves the cacheability. I will talk about that later when I talk about the new Cradle uh, build cache. Um, so that is compile avoidance. Uh, the next optimization I want to talk about is a bit more fine-grained. Uh, we call it ABI usage detection. Uh, so in the case of an ABI change in module 1, so you change the public signature, or you change the signature of a public method, right? Uh, there is still a full recompile of module 1 is happening, uh, but if that change is an ABI change, uh, with compile avoidance, you would also do a full recompile of module 2, right? Uh, but with API usage detection, there is a further check. So you can analyze uh, whether any of the classes that have changed in module 1 are used at all in module 2. And if they are not used at all in module 2, in whatever form, right, then module 2 is not recompiled. Otherwise, it's fully recompiled. Does this make sense? So, um, and uh, what is in interesting to understand about compile avoidance and API usage detection, let's assume all your code lives in one module, right? What does compile avoidance and API usage detection gives you? Nothing. Right, exactly. So, uh, those are uh, fast, uh, pretty cheap checks uh, that also improve the efficiency of getting cached build results, but they still trigger a lot of full recompiles. Uh, the efficiency increases with more and smaller modules. Makes sense, right? Uh, at the same time, having tons of modules does not come for free in terms of build complexity, 
IDE integration, dependency management. So plus the reality of many Android projects is that they have rather large modules. So who of you has an, have, has an Android build where the code is evenly distributed across many small modules? All right, so, yeah. Uh, and uh, to kind of add to that, it is not trivial and an expensive refactoring exercise to break those into smaller modules as you have many cycles between the classes and the packages, right? So that is not something you can do in a day. Okay, so, um, and uh, that is where at least one sweet spot where incremental compile comes in, right? With incremental compile, uh, whatever change is happening, you only recompile the affected classes in, in the module where the change is happening as well uh, as in the modules that depend on that module. And uh, so it is com complementary to compile avoidance uh, and an incremental compile would be hugely beneficial, right, for Android projects. Uh, and just to be clear, we don't encourage to have large modules, right? We encourage to have rather small modules. Uh, the cacheability will also be better that way. Uh, we also plan in the future to have distributed builds. So the compile of separate modules can be easily distributed, well, rather easily, let's say. <laughs> but an incremental compile will always be helpful, right? And it allows you to find the right manageable size of your modules, not to go to crazy small modules without being penalized by build performance issues. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> end of January, uh, Gotham, who's also here tonight, uh, from Uber was presenting on how to have fast uh, Android builds with OKBug. Okay Who of you uh, attended that uh, meeting? Yeah. So, uh, and it might help to understand where Cradle and Bug are when it comes to providing the optimizations we, we, we looked at. Right. So, compile avoidance is something both build tools provide. Uh, Gradle has a very efficient implementation using memory caches for making the analysis very fast, and we, we don't actually build stub jars, so it's pretty cool. But in any case, it's provided by both tools. ABI usage detection as a separate feature is something at this point only Buck provides. Uh, incremental compile is something only Gradle provides, uh, and it is. And incremental compile is a significant superset of ABI usage detection, right? So, uh, and one thing that is important to understand, if you have used the experimental incremental compile before Gradle 3.4, give it another shot. Uh, it is no longer experimental. Uh, it has massively improved and, uh, or in, in terms of reliability and efficiency. Uh, so with all the data we extract for the incremental analysis, it, it will be very easy, or it would be very easy for Gradle to extract ABI usage detection as a separate feature. And in fact, we plan to do so. Uh, why? When it is a subset of incremental compile. So, uh, well, it would be a nice intermediate improvement until we have figured out how to implement incremental compile also for modules that use annotation processes. So, and that is the kind of disappointing news, right? Uh, incremental <coughs> compile is still disabled in modules that use annotation processors, uh, which is the case, as we all know, for many Android modules, right? So uh, we're working on a solution, but it is not trivial to do it the way we think it should be done. So we cannot provide a timeline at this point, but it's, it's high on our <laughs> list of priorities. Uh, and just to be clear, there are many, many more improvements than those optimizations that have made it into the Gradle Android plugin, and Zev will talk about those very soon. But the ones here, I think, are very important to understand uh, from a developer perspective, as they correlate strongly with the structure of your code and the changes you're applying to the code. And they're also at the bottom of the food chain, right? When compilation is avoided, a lot of other tasks don't need to be executed. Okay, so finally, let's look at some numbers. Uh, one project we use for measuring the performance uh, is a very large Android test build. It's not a real project. Uh, you can get it uh, 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 from GitHub. Uh, the README comes with instruction how to use it for benchmarking. It has 135 modules. Uh, it uses annotation processors, uh, which currently disables Cradle's incremental compile in those modules that use annotation processors. Uh, <coughs> it is a fork <laughs> of the project uh, Gotam has used to compare performance between Gradle and OKBug end of January, right? If anything, it has grown until then. So the code uh, 
is very evenly spread across small modules. We have added some capability to, to, to generate source code, and it's, it's optimized for a build system like Buck. Right. Uh, uh. Okay, so, ta 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 ta. Uh, there are four use cases we want to talk about. Uh, the first one is to rebuild a clean, full rebuild of a single variant. So with Gradle 2.2, <coughs> Sorry. Uh, and two four, cra with Cradle Android plugin 2.2 and Cradle 2.14.1, this takes six minutes. Right? With Buck, this takes 18 seconds, so it's four to five times faster. With uh, Android plugin 2.3 and Cradle 3.4, we got this down to 90 seconds. And with, uh, uh, and this is GA, right? And with 2.5 Alpha and Cradle 2.3.5, uh, we have this now also down to 18, 80 seconds. So uh, when we change a single line of code that changes the API with Gradle Android uh, uh, plugin 2.2, this takes uh, 210 seconds. Can you, can you read those seconds? Probably not. You can? Perfect. Ah, you have more. Okay. I was super. Yeah. Makes sense. Uh, <laughs> so um, with Buck, this takes 26 seconds. Uh, with Cradle 2.3, we are at 37 seconds. Cradle Android plugin 2.3, uh, and with 2.5 Alpha, we are 25 seconds. And, uh, but this is where things already get a bit tricky, right? Because we picked an ABI change that actually is used in the dependent modules, right? So if you would have changed the ABI and the modules would not be affected by that, uh, bug would be nine seconds faster. But in this case, Gradle would also be faster <laughs> because uh, uh, some modules don't use annotation processors, so the incremental comp compile kicks in. Uh, so that is six seconds when the classes are, are not used in dependent modules. And uh, the other thing you have to keep in mind with those numbers, when they are used by our instant run in Edward Studio, it gives you another three seconds because they, they, they do some optimization that they, they basi basically tell Gradle what, give Gradle some context what, what they don't need to do. <coughs> so, um, Let's look at the non-ABI change scenario. Uh, we have 210 seconds. It didn't matter in, in Android plugin 2.2. 17 seconds with bug. 37 seconds with 2.3. And 8 seconds with 2.5 alpha, which is 26 times faster than with Gradle 2.2. Uh, so in, indeed, an extremely fast build, considering the size of the project. Uh, once Gradle has ABI usage detection, right? We, will also benefit uh, uh, the other scenario. Um, and uh, also once we have a metal compile working with annotation processors that, that will improve the for, for, for performance both for ABI change and non-ABI change. Uh, so a couple of things I would like to uh, point out. This test project represents a corner case, right? It does not reflect the reality of 99% of the Android projects out there. And it created some non-linear performance effects because of its size, right? So, for example, with Android plugin 2.2, half of the build time was spent uh, in the garbage collector, right? Because it hit memory limits, right? So, for most Android projects, Buck was never 4 to 12 times faster or anything like that. Uh, we talked with quite a few teams about that. Uh, it depends heavily on the project, right? Uh, uh, but it also means, uh, <laughs> on the other hand, that if you try the latest changes out, don't necessarily expect that your project will be 26 times faster uh, when you update to Cradle 2.5 Alpha. And we talk, we, we look at a, at a different uh, a project soon. Makes sense, right? So uh, uh, the other thing you can see is that 2.3, which is already GA, is a massive improvement, right? And, and mostly due to all the changes the, the uh, Android team did. Uh, who is already using 2.3? It's curious. Okay, the others have something to do tomorrow. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, finally, last year, my, my nightmare before Christmas was uh, uh, where those performance numbers. Uh, so this is a kind of synthetic benchmark. So you, you rebuild a single variant when nothing has changed, right? Usually you don't execute a build when nothing has changed, but uh, uh, anyhow, you can do it, right? And, uh, and that takes 180 seconds with Gradle 2.2 and with OK, back this took 0.8 seconds. So that was like, oh my goodness, 200 times faster than everyone was sending me emails. And uh, yeah. 
So, uh, I mean, people like to use benchmarks that, that show kind of strength of their technology. That's fine. Uh, with 2.3, this is down to 8 seconds, right? With 2.5 alpha, this is down to 5 seconds. And uh, so this is a benchmark where Buck still has an advantage. At the same time, it also shows the potential. We will get this further down. There's no question about this. And this will affect you know, the, the gradle baseline for all the other benchmarks. If we get this down by three seconds, everything else will be three seconds faster. So it uh, gives you some idea. Uh, so now let's look at a different experiment. Uh, what we did is we added 250,000 lines of code into one of the modules of the, of the performance Android large test build, right? So, uh, and this is where Buck becomes inefficient. Uh, in fact, it crashed when we added more than 250,000 lines of code. Uh, and with Gradle, you can add 5 million lines of code, and things will run stable. They will take some time, obviously, but they will run stable. And uh, so, but even when you do it with 250,000 lines of code, right, you, you, and you change, you change uh, uh, a class uh, that has an ABI effect within that module, it takes, with OK Buck or with Buck, it takes 23 seconds, and with 2.5 uh, uh, alpha, it takes 9 seconds. Right? So it's kind of interesting perspective as many Android teams deals with, deal with large modules. OK, so let's look at uh, a different build. I think a build that probably reflects uh, uh, more yeah, the reality of, of quite a few Android teams. It's, uh, uh, it's also available at GitHub. Uh, it's a real project. It's a fork of the uh, K9 email client for Android. It has four modules. And most code uh, lives in one module. Right? And it does not use annotation processors. Uh, so let's look at the numbers here. Uh, so with 2.2, rebuilding a single variant took 11 seconds. Uh, and that shows you that it's a much smaller project compared to the 360 seconds right, we, we had from uh, the large Android build. Uh, so with 2.3, uh, this gets down to 10 seconds. With 2.5 alpha, this gets down to 8 seconds. Right? And, and one reason why things are not that much faster is that the parallelization is not that effective in projects with a small number of modules where one module is, is large. And this is to some degree inherent, right? Uh, they are more sequential in nature. Uh, to some degree, it, it is uh, also due to uh, the pretty coarse grained current cradle parallelism. And uh, Zev will talk in detail about that, what we can do to make this better. Uh, so uh, let's look at uh, ABI change, 2.9, 2.4, 2.2 seconds. Non-ABI change, 2.9, 2, and 1.6 seconds, and no op single variant. Was never slow, right? Uh, 0 .2, uh, 500 milliseconds, 400 milliseconds, 400 milliseconds. Um, so it's interesting, right? The incremental compile is kicking in here. Uh, we're not using annotation processors, but it's not having a strong effect. Uh, because we changed a class that has a lot of coupling and is causing the recompile of many other classes. So we did this deliberately. We don't want to show always the most optimal scenarios, right? Uh, so the effectiveness of avoidance uh, depends a lot on how your source code is structured and what dependencies it has and what exactly you're changing, right? Uh, another thing I would like to point out, uh, <laughs> imagine you were the owner of this project. Right? And uh, assume you read in the release notes that configuration time is now with 2.5 alpha up to 36 times faster. It's true. We've seen it in the other project. And then you try it out and you see, oh, it's not faster at all for my project. Right? That just performance has many dimensions. It depends a lot on the context. And uh, uh, because we heard some complaints in the past, we cannot reproduce your performance kind of numbers that, that you say you have achieved with a, with a new release. We're now pretty uh, strict about when we make a performance claim, we always show, hey, you can reproduce it with this project, right? And then you have to see how the context applies to your context, right? So, uh, okay. So those improvements are great. They're not a game changer. At the same time, I wouldn't consider this project performance-wise to be in heavy pain. Would you, would you agree or, yeah. So who is, who is worse off than those guys? So, uh, in any case, the performance work is far from done. Uh, we continue to do substantial and deep uh, uh, changes to improve performance. And uh, just want to talk about uh, various areas where this is happening. So 
Dependency resolution is one area where we are working on. Uh, so uh, uh, we had some inefficiencies when you were applying many exclude rules to the dependency management of Gradle. So there's the test project above, and uh, uh, with the, the, even with, with Gradle 3.4, and I think also with 3.5, uh, it will take 43 seconds just to build the dependency graph, even if all the dependencies are in your local cache. And uh, with Gradle Master, it now takes four seconds. So if you don't have any exclude rules, it will give you zero performance improvement. If you have a lot of them, it will make things much faster. Probably more, more applicable to, to, uh, uh, to uh, the majority of the projects is that we uh, make downloading dependencies faster by, uh, 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 at, at this point, by making the logs more fine-trained so that when you run a build in parallel, dependency downloads are much faster. So this is, this is now, this project, after you, we have applied the improvement for the exclude rules, but when the cache is empty and all the dependencies need to be downloaded, right? And with Gradle Master, we got this down to 20 seconds. So when you have many external dependencies, that will be interesting for you. Uh, so next is parallel downloads always on, even if you don't execute a Gradle build with dash dash parallel. And then uh, after that, uh, not just parallel downloads of the dependencies, but actual parallel resolution of the dependency graph. That will give us another performance boost when it comes to dependency management. So talking about parallelism, uh, so Cradle's current parallelism is per sub-project, which is coarse-grained, and depending on the project type, it can be inefficient. So who of you is using Gradle always with dash dash parallel? Is that uh, uh, enabled by default from Android Studio when you run by, okay. So it's definitely something you should look into, right? Uh, but the point is, it, it can be inefficient for, for especially for smaller projects. So for the performance Android large project, run this, when you run this build with Gradle dash dash parallel, the utilization of the core is almost, the core is almost 100%, right? But uh, uh, for the K9 project, it's a very different story. Uh, and the other, the other problem with the Gradle parallelism, it's not 100% foolproof. This is why it's not enabled by default, and that is why most of you are not using it, because you have to reconfigure your build. Many people, many projects use it successfully, but you can shoot yourself in the foot, right? So, uh, so with the next release of Gradle, so 3.5 RC2 is out, so I, I mean the next release is Gradle 4.0 after 3.5. Uh, we will provide an API to run task actions in parallel safely, right? And, uh, and parallel actions will not be able to mutate any shared state. Uh, the API supports out of process and in process actions. So you, you can tell Gradle and we will manage all the, the daemon processes for you when you, when you do out of process actions. Uh, <clears throat> Any plugin task can make use of this, right? And uh, Gradle score tasks, including the Android test, they will make use of that as soon as this is available. Xavier will talk about that. Uh, so it's pretty cool. Tasks can use this API even if they just have one action. So when you write a task with one action, you can still say, hey, Gradle, this is a parallelizable action. And then it gets executed in parallel with parallelizable action from other tasks. or Let's say you write a uh, Gradle C++ compile task. You can also use that if you have a lot of parallelism within your task to parallelize that, right? So uh, I'm super excited about this. Uh, it's foundational. And the key challenge, right, is, uh, uh, well, first of all, it will become default this year. The key challenge is, is to make this fully backwards compatible, right? And that's what we're doing, right? And uh, so it will not break your, your existing builds, and it's a kind of, it's a, it's an evolutionary step, right? And then slowly, the plugins in the ecosystem can pick up this API and make their, make their task parallelizable. Uh, but the core task will be parallelizable pretty soon that come from Gradle and come from the Android plugin. So I'm similarly excited about the last feature I want to talk about tonight. Uh, and this is the Gradle build cache. Uh, so the current Gradle up-to-date mechanism is great, and, it, uh, it, and it's still very valuable. It provides generic support for incremental tasks. That is the key thing, right? When you write a Gradle task, Gradle tells you, hey, since the build was run the last time, those files have changed, right? And, and so it's easy for a task to, uh, to implement incrementalism, right? And, and that is something we get from the up-to-date mechanism. But it has no history for task output, right? So let's say when you switch between branches in your Android build, right, and you build branch B, you go back to branch A, 
all the output is lost, you have to fully rebuild branch A again. And of course, uh, there's no way to share output across uh, developers or across CI agents. Uh, so Cradle 3.5 comes with a better version of a new cache layer. And uh, this supports a local uh, and a remote cache that can store build output over time. Uh, we tried hard. We wanted to get this ready for, for tonight. Uh, but we did not manage to, 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 to finish the configuration for the Android plugin. So at the moment, the cache is pre-configured only for the Java tasks that come with Gradle. So, uh, but we hope we can change that very soon. So that's why I can only show you performance numbers from uh, uh, a large enterprise Java project, uh, publicly available under this GitHub URL. Uh, so with the cache disabled, it takes 304 seconds to build it. And with the, with the local cache enabled, it, it gets down to 15 seconds. And with the remote cache, it's, it's 17 seconds, right? So this should, and without raising too much expectations, this cache, the effect of this cache is stronger, the more computationally expensive it is to produce the output, right? So you will not get any benefits from caching a copy task, right? But uh, uh, caching vexing tasks and sharing them amongst developers via remote cache will probably have a, have a strong impact. Okay, so uh, you can already play around with it. Uh, but as I said, it's not yet configured out of the box for the Android plugin. So uh, one other thing I want to talk about is uh, the Gradle Summit. Uh, so it's, it's a pretty special show this year. So everyone with an interest in Android builds should not miss the Gradle Summit. Uh, we have a dedicated Android track, uh, including a three-hour Android performance workshop uh, delivered by Xav and uh, Stefan Ulme, who is leading the Gradle performance team which is alone worth attending. Right? CFP ends April 7, so if you have talk ideas, please submit. Uh, the second track will also be very interesting. It's uh, with talks and work workshops around uh, caching, parallelization, multi-repo environments, including a keynote from the Netflix uh, uh, developer tools lead, Mike McGar. Uh, and there's the Cradle ecosystem track, where we talk about Cradle for Kotlin, C++, JavaScript, Golang, and so on. Uh, so it's a it's a special event this year because so much innovation uh, and substantial new capabilities have been released in a pretty short amount of time, right? And it's almost like an explosion. And uh, it's by far the best place to get up to speed and, and meet smart people with a similar focus. So, uh, yeah, I hope I can all welcome you at this show. Um, location is also very nice. <laughs> okay, so uh, the last thing I want to talk about, uh, performance is top of mind for us. So to make it easier to measure and profile Gradle performance, we have created the Gradle Profiler. And uh, so you can easily, with the Gradle Profiler, create profiles for uh, Gradle Build Scans, J Profiler, UKIT, Chrome Trace, Honest Profiler, Java Flight Recorder. Uh, and uh, it's a pretty cool tool. Uh, it provides a DSL for performance scenarios, right? So you can create a, a scenario file and then define multiple performance scenarios that will then all be executed. Uh, this is a simple scenario. Hey, I want to measure uh, a benchmark and profile Gradle assemble. But you can also say, hey, uh, for this scenario, I want to use multiple Gradle versions to benchmark again. And uh, please also compare with Buck. So we also support Buck and Maven, not for creating profiles, but for, for, making, for being part of the benchmarking. Right? And you can define build environment settings and how many warm-ups you, you want to have uh, uh, before the, the measuring should start. So uh, I, I really invite you to use that tool. When, whenever people reach out to us right, and say, hey, we have performance issues. Can you have a deeper look into that? We say, hey, use the profiler, create a profile. It uh, makes things much easier. It even provides uh, uh, support for incremental scenarios. So you can say, hey, uh, for this performance scenario, apply an ABI change to that class. Apply a non-ABI change to that class. And then we run it 10 times, we apply the change, we do the change, we run it, you, you get the idea. OK, and uh, finally, uh, the most convenient and shareable way to get uh, more insights into your build is to create a build scan. Who of you has ever, have ever, has ever created a build scan? Right? Who has never heard about build scans? Yeah, so go to scans.gradle.com. Uh, it's a free hosted service that we provide that allows you to upload, view, and share build scans that basically capture everything that is happening during a build. 
uh, it is not just about performance, it also captures dependencies. You can add your own data to a build scan. And uh, uh, yeah, I really encourage you to check this out if you have not done so already. Uh, it makes reasoning about a build so much easier and, and convenient, right? And, uh, uh, and it makes it super easy to share it with the Android team, with the community, when you have a question on Stack Overflow. So, okay, that's it from my side. Hello everyone, so my name is Xavier Ducroy. I'm the uh, tech lead for Developer Tools, and I'm gonna talk about why Android builds are so slow, or you know, used to be slow, I guess, since you, know, you all show all the numbers. Uh, we, we still have work to do. All right, so uh, th there's really three main reasons, right? And uh, you know, I'll be nice to hands and point out that it doesn't have much to do with Gradle. It's a lot of problems in our uh, plugin, though sometimes we do stretch the capabilities of Gradle, and that's why we've worked with them in order to solve some of those problems. So the first one is, well, we have a lot of tasks that are just not incremental, right? And you, you saw those numbers with one big project. Um, if you have 200,000 line of code and you need to run Java C and then DX and then the package builder and ProGuard and all of that, none of those tasks are incremental or were incremental and that can lead to really uh, uh, large uh, build time. Uh, the, th the second one is um, we definitely had issues in our plugin. We are doing too many things all the time. So there, there's two phases in Gradle, right? There's the configuration phase where all the model of all the modules and dependencies and task graph is created, and then there's actually executing the task graph. We are doing too much, in some case, with not very efficient code. That's why that 2.2 number is so big, because like, you know, configuration uh, used to take like three minutes for that big project, and uh, by just profiling and fixing the code, we got down to like, you know, 10 seconds. That's kind of like um, sad. Um, <laughs> we're making more progress to make it even faster, but you know, th that's where the 2.3 numbers come, not from actually a lot of changes. Uh, so that's doing too much all the time. And then uh, scalability issue, you know, where, uh, you know, Android is very different from just building pure Java modules. And so we are really having, uh, we were having issues with APIs uh, that didn't really allow us to do all the parallelism that we wanted and things like that. So uh, let's start with non-incremental tasks first. So those are really like the main, I would say, five bottleneck tasks in any Android build, right? It's running Java C, uh, running APT, uh, running DX, you know, ProGuard if you have it, and legacy multidex if you have that too. Uh, and then building the final APK, right? Building the final APK doesn't seem like it would be slow, but you know, we've s seen some apps that are like you know, 20, 30 meg, and just building a big zip file and compressing all of that, you know, we see some apps taking tens of seconds to do that. Right? So, and actually that's the first one that we started working on. So um, we released an incremental packager, I think in 2.2. Uh, it's been out for a while behind a flag. Um, so first it reused compressed entries from the previous APK that you built. So if there's a file in your APK that did not change, we don't have to recompress it. And then it compresses all the entries in parallel, which you know, if you just use the regular zip API in Java, it just does not happen, right? So, um, and then it also zip align in a single pass. Uh, and we're seeing some really good performance improvement you know, for really large application every time you have to redo an APK, which is every time when you build, right? So that's new in 2.2, I think. Definitely in 2.3, but I think it's new in 2.2. Uh, so switch to 2.3, that way you're sure. Um, <laughs> Okay, so we have an experimental shrinker that is still experimental right now. So who's using ProGuard to shrink your code to be below the multidex limit? Wait a minute, you. Um, so uh, ProGuard is slow, uh, but like shrinking in general is gonna be slow anyway. The new shrinker is not incremental either, but it has one advantage is that when it looks at all the code and you have all the inputs, you have your main app uh, module, right? You have all your sub module, all your dependencies. Um, what ProGuard does is it take all of those, it shrinks it, and then create one single jar. And so basically every time anything changes, it has to redex everything. So the new shrinker will, uh, and it does only shrinking, right? It doesn't do obfuscation, it doesn't do optimization, so it's really only for debug mode, right? Um, it's gonna output, you know, create an output for each of the inputs. So if you have three sub module, your main app, and 10 dependencies, you're gonna have 14 different output. And that means that if you just change something in your app or in your library, in a sub module, but you don't touch any of the library, and your change doesn't impact changing the output of the shrinking, then all those libraries that were predex can be reused, and all we have to do at the end is the dex merger. So it just makes build a lot faster. Um, and also, we're gonna add legacy multidex computation to that, since you know, in order to shrink anyway, we have to look at the whole call graph and all of that. Um, right now, if you run multidex and shrinking, we're running ProGuard twice for you, because you know, we know you like it, so uh, you know, it's awesome. Um, <laughs> So right now you can use it, uh, in 2.2 you can use it as well. Uh, there's basically on the build type, if you say minified enable, true, uh, you can also say use ProGuard false and then it will use the new shrinker. And it's on build type so you can use ProGuard in release and in debug just use the new shrinker. Um, 
And we, we've seen some good performance when you talk to developer and they show us their build and we enable it. Uh, it, it can really help for debug builds. Uh, incremental dexing. So we talked about um, you know, multi-dex and all of that, but right now dexing was still you know, like if you have a module, we just dex it as one version. And so in 2.4, we are starting to have incremental dexing. We're going to dex on a per class basis. And so we only redex the class that changed, and then we just dex merge everything at the end. Uh, it's, uh, it's in 2.4. It should go live in uh, stable in 2.4. It's already available in like the three or two or three alphas that we released of 2.4, so you can definitely try it. Um, and again, we're, we're seeing some good performance improvement there. Um, all right, APT uh, is currently not incremental. Uh, there's people keep asking me, that's why I did it there. You know, there's a new tool called APT2 uh, that has some support for incremental. We are planning on integrating it. We're not sure when exactly, but that's definitely on, on the roadmap. Uh, and then Java C, uh, you know, I, I added that uh, line, but you know, you, you've seen all the, the improvement coming. Um, you know, compilation avoidance, and one other aspect also, you know, uh, that Hans didn't talk about, but, um, and we'll introduce that in, uh, in 2.5, or we'll make that capability available to you as Android developer, is the ability to um, not necessarily just use compile, but use implementation or API. I don't know if you guys saw that in uh, Gradle 3.4 or 5, yep. that introduced it in 4, right? Where, you know, the idea is if you have an app, uh, a library module that has a dependency, the question is, should consumer of that library see any of its dependency on the class pass automatically or not, right? So if you, if you want to use it, then use API, but if you use implementation, then it tells consumer that if they really want to use the transitive dependency, they have to do it manually, or they have to add them themselves. And that means that if your library depends on something and that something changed, compiler avoidance may work only for, uh, may not work for your module, right? You know, you change an API in your dependency, that module will get recompiled, but whoever consumes you will not because by default they just don't see that dependency anyway. So it's, it's, it adds even more compilation avoidance. If you can use implementation, that's a lot better. And you know, we're looking with, with the Gradle team at improving um, incremental support with annotation processor. All right, so that's you know, like the main task. You know, we want to basically, we want to make all of those tasks very incremental so that if you don't have 200 modules, then you can still get some benefit from improvement. Um, so the, the second point is our plugin was doing too much all the time, which you know is during the configuration time. So in 2.4, <coughs> one of the changes is uh, we're doing dependency resolution during the execution phase. Um, basically, you know, whenever you build, you know, it, before 2.4, you have at least five variants set up in your module, right? You know, if, even if you don't create any build type or product flavor, you have debug release. Um, unit test debug, unit test release, and, and uh, Android test for debug. And so we would resolve the dependency graph of all five of those variants, and there's actually two of them, so we resolve 10 graphs. But it, all you end up doing is, is just building debug or just running help or whatever, then we still resolve them. Uh, and that's just, you know, silly. Um, so uh, we fixed that in 2.4. Um, it's not as good as 2.5 because in 2.5 we have a lot of new APIs that really allow us to do that very well, but it's still a much better uh, improvement like the, the skeleton project, right? It goes from like 10 seconds to like between two and three seconds. So it's a big, it's a big improvement. Um, I know he said eight seconds on his slide, but I think it's just like it depends on which machine you use. Again, yeah. Um, so in 2.5, you know, we have better uh, support for that. Uh, and then we are starting to add more things to uh, execution phase. Uh, we used to, in the process of resolving all those dependencies, which I'll explain a little bit why we are doing that, um, we are also doing some validation, making sure that if you have a, task, uh, a test, an app and a test app, the two graphs matched and didn't have any discrepancy and things like that. We are doing a lot of processing, which really we should not do uh, you know, during configuration phase. So we're moving that to execution phase as well. Uh, we have a feature where you can you know, create multiple APKs with different densities and there's an auto mode and every time you run a build, basically we'd go look at your source code to see you know, hey, which density you're using to create those. And you know, again, that's something you should do at execution phase. And you know, we're, we're looking at a lot, of, a lot of other cases where we just want to move as many things as possible so that when you do a build that doesn't use any of that computation that we used to do, you just don't do it. So it's pretty basic, but um, it, it's not as large scale as some of the other things that we're doing, but it's still important because every time you do a build, you're going to run into it, right? All right, so let's talk about scalability and parallelism. So we know that, you know, there's a bunch of people who are like, you know, well, if I don't have incremental dexing or incremental Java C or whatever, let's have, you know, dozens of modules. And clearly that did not work very well. Uh, so I want to show you what the problem is here. Um, so if you look at a regular Java plugin, right, like the output is a jar, right? I mean, and the Java plugin itself has basically like, you know, five tasks or something like that. There's 
compile, there's process resources, there's JAR, there's very, very few tasks. Um, and the output is just a JAR file, and it can be used by the compilation, right? Java C directly reads the JAR file, and it can be used by the runtime, the JVM, so it's very convenient. Um, in our case, um, well, because we have a lot more things than just Java, uh, we said, well, let's create that, you know, AR uh, archive that's going to be awesome. We're going to be putting a lot of stuff in there. So actually, right now, we had 14 items in there. When we started, we had probably half of that, uh, but we're adding new things like, you know, the program rule, the, uh, the list of public resources, lin.jar, you know, things like that, and we're just adding more and more things. Uh, but it's really creating a lot of problem. And when I, when I said earlier that, you know, it's kind of, the Gradle plugin, it's kind of stretching some of the APIs and capabilities of Gradle, that's really kind of like the core of the problem. Uh, and the biggest problem is that we have to unzip it before we can actually do anything with it. So, um, and it's really triggering like a huge bottleneck in, in different ways, right? And the first one, of course, we have to build it. So we are zipping something that needs to be unzipped by the submodule right next to it. So that's kind of silly. Um, and, and it means that in order to zip it, you have to basically have every single item that goes in it to be built and, and ready to go, right? Uh, so on the consuming side, we have to unzip it. And, and the way the APIs worked, um, we couldn't really have, <coughs> you know, like a task for one dependency that's going to unzip it as soon as it's ready, and then another task for another dependency that are going to unzip it as soon as it's ready. And, and, and there's two reasons for that, right? The first one is, well, if we want to do all the dependency resolution during execution phase, um, during configuration where we set up the task, we don't know how many dependencies we have, right? Because of all the transitive dependencies. So that's a problem. Um, and once we know, uh, once we do all the dependency resolution, uh, during execution phase, well, the task graph is locked and you can't add a new task. You can say, oh, by the way, here, here's another task and please also run it, right? So, so there's no really mechanism in Gradle to really help with that. And then on top of that, the APIs to deal with consuming dependencies in Gradle uh, did not allow us to be like, you know, um, you know, there's an API to get the list of dependencies and then let's say you get 10 jars and what you really want to do is say, okay, for this jar, just, you know, I want to create a task that's only going to depend on whatever generates just that IR and not the other ones. And, and so basically what we end up with is all the tasks in before 2.5 kind of like have to depend on all the submodules to be done. And everything that we do in terms of dependencies is even though we do it in parallelism or whatever, they only start working when all the submodules are done building. Right? And so that, that creates a huge bottleneck in your task graph and that's a big problem. Um, okay, so, and so if we look at a build flow, so let's say you have an app and a library, right? and the app depends on the library obviously, on the left, you have some tasks from the app. You know, I only put a few there. On the right, you have the task for the library. And really building really just looks like that, right? The first one is the manifest merger. That's probably one of the deepest one in your task graph. And, and then you run the resource merger, AP, Java C, then you package it, then you unzip it, then you run all the other one, and there's no parallelism whatsoever. But in fact, like the manifest merger in the app, really all it cares about is the manifest generated by the uh, library, right? And that's all it cares about, right? And so we really needed to fix that. So, um, we worked with the Gradle team in order to get new APIs that allow us not to publish the AR, but publish all the 14 different APIs, uh, all the 14 different components that makes an AR separately. And, and there's nothing in Gradle, or there was nothing in Gradle that would be like, hey, I'm a module and I'm publishing a whole bunch of stuff and someone needs to consume only part of it, right? It, it was just like, you know, I'm a module and I'm publishing a jar and then the other module just consume it and that's it, right? There was no API to deal with all of that. So we had to work uh, closely with them in order to add all of that. And so on the other side, what I want to do is I want to be able to say, look, I just care about the manifest, just give me a list of manifests, uh, make that as lazy as possible so that I can do that during configuration time and set up my task without doing any work. And I want the dependency associated with that list of manifests to only contain whatever generate the manifest and nothing else. I don't care about the output of Java C, right? I just want to have as fine-grained dependency as possible from a task-to-task -task, uh, type of dependency. So that's the API. I don't know if you you're familiar with some of the uh, Gradle API, but there's the normal one, you do configuration.get files, and you get a file collection. Actually, you get a set uh, of files, but um, you just get a list of files, and that's it. So here, um, you know, you, the, the, the whole uh, API is on the artifact view. You can say, I only want Android manifest, which is a type that we register when we publish the manifest. We say, this is the type. And then we get a file collection, which is like a lazy object that then we can query for the actual list of um, file, but more importantly, we can use as an input of a task and then the task only run when you know, all the things that generate that file collection are generated, and that will be only the, uh, the, the tasks that generate manifest. So now if we look at a build flow, it looks like that, and we have parallelism. And you know, we don't actually build the AR, because even though we do publish it, so that if you want to publish it you know, to Maven or whatever, you can, 
but you know, during a build, it's like it's never generated, it's never unzipped, it's you know, it's just not used at all. So it's much faster. And like all the gain that we get from uh, you know the, the large uh, project that Hans showed, you know, except for the few uh, seconds that we save by doing dependency resolution at execution phase, all of the gain is due to that parallelism, right? We we have a Chrome trace of before where there's a lot of white and just you know something happening every now and then. And then we have, you know, after it's just like it's just like full of like task happening, you know, and as Hans said, basically the CPU is 100 percent all the time. Until the very hand where we do a bit of flexing, I'm gonna talk about it. And then the APK packaging and that's it. So it's much faster. Um, so that works well for when you have submodules, but the problem is um, external ARs, well you still have those ARs, so you need to extract them. And so it's the same thing that I talked about earlier where you know, during configuration, you don't know how many you have, so you can't really create a task for them. You don't want to create a single task that's going to extract all of them because then you have to wait until they're ready, which in that case would be downloaded, and we're going to get, you know, uh, download in parallel. So really what you want is as soon as one is downloaded, you can unzip it if needed. Um, and so uh, since we can't use task, uh, we, uh, uh, the Gradle team came up with the artifact transform, where it's basically you, we register a bunch of transforms saying, you know, hey, if you have an AR, and I ask you for manifest, here's a small class that will transform from the AR to the manifest. In fact, we do from AR to exploded AR, like the unzip version, and then from exploded AR to Android manifest. Um, and those transform run, you know, only when they're needed, they're run in parallel, they're cached. So it's basically, you know, the same thing as a task that run nicely in parallel, but it's not a task because we need that, um, you know, dynamic, you know, setup where we just don't know how many we have. Um, and then it's kind of magic, right? Uh, the API that I showed earlier with the artifact view, when we say give me all the manifest, well, we're going to get them, you know, even those part of our file collection. So basically, we get all the manifest, and then the dependency of that file collection is either a bunch of tasks in the submodule that created, or some transforms in, um, you know, uh, those artifact transform that will unzip and you know return the manifest that was inside an AR, and it just works out of the box, and it's, you know, nothing happens. There's no computation during configuration time. It all happens at execution time. So it's pretty cool. Um, after all of that, we still have a little bit of a predicting bottleneck. Um, you know, so predicting, you know, uh, you know, it's like we, we dex all of the different modules and dependency separately, and then we merge them later. Um, so right now, in 2.5, when we ship 2.5, it will still not be as parallel as we want it to be, yet it's something we'll do after. Um, so basically, you know, what happens is that um, Basically, the transform don't really run eagerly, right? So what happens is that when the predex, the merging task is ready to run, it's going to realize that it needs some predex library, and, and then it's going to run the transform at that time. And so what we end up with is, you know, let's say you have an app that depends on library one, that depends on a library two, and you change something in library two, you recompile library two, then you recompile library one, and then you recompile app, and then, then the, predex, the merger say, hey, now you, I still need some run, task to run, and we're going to run one single predex task that kind of like, you know, does all three of them at the same time and in parallel or whatever, but if you have 100 modules and only 10 core, then it doesn't work at all, right? And so, um, <coughs> pardon me. Yeah, what, what we want to do is basically allow Gradle to be smarter and, and way ahead in, in the way it schedules the task graph to be like, hey, that particular transform, you know, um, you know as soon as library two is built, that particular transform, I want to run it. Uh, because I know I'll need it later and I have time in my you know, parallelism and scheduler and I can run it now rather than running just before the DEX merger. And so it will look more like that, basically. You know, you'll have more parallelism because as soon as Java C is done for library two, we can run predexing while we're running another Java C in parallel and, and things like that. Right? Um, okay, and then uh, the worker API, right? So uh, Hans talked about it. Uh, we're definitely gonna use, uh, use it. We're, we're looking at nightlies right now of, of Gradle and uh, it, it showed up there, so we're gonna start using it. Uh, so we're gonna get finally parallelism, right? There isn't that many tasks in a Gradle module that needs to be run in parallel, um, but there are some that could run in parallel, right? And we know Bug does that, and it's very interesting where they, they run APT and Java C together, even though normally, basically in our case, Java C requires the output of APT, which is you know, the R class, in order to run, so they quickly create a fake R class, run Java C with that, and then run the final APT in parallel. So, uh, you know, we're looking at that kind of change in the flow in order to make benefit of, of, uh, of the, the, the worker API. Um, and then, uh, you know, uh, Hans mentioned that the worker API would allow you to run things outside, you know, out of process. 
by managing you know small demons and stuff like that. So I'm sure plenty of you have struggled with you know Dex in process outside of process. Where do I set up the memory? Why does it keep asking me for more memory to you know run it in process? Uh, so that would go away, right? It would always be out of the demon, uh, the greater demon process, but in its own process. Uh, and then we can run, you know, we can start more of them uh, as needed. You don't have to be, to look at the worst case scenario, which is, well, on my CI machine, I need to run ProGuard because I'm doing obfuscation. And because my app is big, ProGuard needs 6 gigs of RAM. And so everyone needs to put in their greater properties, I need 8 gigs, right? And then your daemon always uses 8 gigs and it's awful. Uh, GCs take longer and it's just, it's terrible, right? So our goal is really to get the greater daemon to be as small as possible. And when needed, use an external process that will be long lived. And if you have plenty of memory on your machine, it will stay there, right? But um, you know, ProGuard can run out of process, DX can run out of process. I mean, Java C right now already run out of process, right? Uh, but then the, the Gradle will handle you know, keeping those demons alive depending on how much memory you have and things like that. It's not yet in, so none of that is in 2.5 yet. Um, but um, all, the, all the parallelism that I talked about is in 2.5. Uh, so 2.5, you know. Um, we have a preview out. It's been out for a few weeks now. Um, we're obviously now we, by, uh, we hadn't released any 2.4 preview before, so people were a bit confused how we went from 2.3 to 2.5. Uh, we're going to do it in parallel with 2.4. We're going to go all the way through beta and ensemble in 2.4 and then keep going on previews and betas and, and RCs or whatever for, for 2.5. Uh, we're looking at releasing preview too soon. Uh, we didn't do it because we, we broke a bunch of APIs that, you know, some people, you know, some plugins or um, even some people's uh, um, uh, customization of, of their build Gradle file used, um, like the Crashatix plug plugin doesn't work with 2.5. We're working to put back the API and sort of make it work when the Crashatix plug plugin is there. Uh, if you have any uh, interest in trying it, we have a bunch of migration information and, and things like that. And that's it. <laughs> uh,